Welcome to the Money Maven Project Podcast. If you're here to learn how to obtain freedom over your time and money through real estate investing, you're in the right place. Create the life you want by living with intention and becoming a maven in mindset, money, and real estate. Now, here's your host, Justin Monk. Hey, this is Justin Monk with the Money Maven Project podcast. We've got George Gibson, right? Yes. Gibson. Yes. George Gibson on the podcast here. I'm super excited to hear this story. So, um, about quitting your nine to five as a mailman and jumping into real estate. I'm super excited to, to talk more about that. So give us a really quick, uh, kind of history where you come from and, and how you got to where you are today. All right. Yes. My name is George Gibson. I am based out of Florida and I, I, I was a mailman for the last five years at the postal service. And just like many people out there, I had, like, deep down inside, I knew I was meant to do more. But I really couldn't put my finger on it because it, around my circle, everybody was like, you got a great job, George. You, you retire in 30 years, and, you know, you travel the world after you retire. And in my spirit, it just ain't sick right with that. So as I started continuing to deliver mail, I started reading audio, listening to audio books, and I discovered real estate. Um, I wanted to figure out how to make money a business, but real estate like came easy and natural to me. So I started learning about real estate, listening to podcasts, reading audio books, and that's where it all started. I started um, looking for deals on my mail route, and eventually I purchased one deal, I purchased a second house, and I just started um, buying rental properties off my mail route and trying to flip houses, and that's my story. And now I quit my job. Um, ever since last year of May, and I've been doing real estate investing full time. This, that is so impressive, man. And, and it, so, kind of a cool story in a sense that you are literally walking the streets, driving the streets, being the mailman, seeing houses that look like they're distressed, and those are the ones that you start making offers on. That's cool. Give us an example, maybe a deal that you you found that way and how you got it. Well. Um, but the beginning part, it was much a learning curve. Yeah. So I was, you know, I was driving in the mail truck. And one thing about, you know, you're in the mail truck, I was talking to the tenants, not tenants. They're not my tenants, but I talked to people like, hey, how much are you paying for rent? Yeah. And just started getting from familiarizing myself with, you know, what the market is. So one of the first properties I found out, it was, I was delivering mail on like a Friday or Thursday. And I seen a sign say auction this Saturday. So Happened on that Saturday, I was off work and I was like, okay, that house is right across the street from the post office. I think I should go for that one. So I show up to the auction Saturday. I'm off work. This uh, this house is literally located uh, diagonal across from the post office. So I'm like, that'll be like perfect opportunity. I can look at it. that's my house. I work mm -hmm. here, but I see mm -hmm. the, I see my out at the post office. So I go to this auction and um, I'm there. This is my first auction ever. It's cash auction. You got to pay 10% down the second you win the auction. So I'm at the auction, and the house is three bedroom, one bath. And then in my area, these houses rent for about 900 a month. So that house, that was the first one. I went to the auction. I'm bidding, and I, I bid it on the property. I ended up winning at the auction like $52,000. And that property, you know, it was worth immediately $75,000. And that was like my first deal where I bought a property, um, you know, $50,000 and I ended up selling it like a couple months later for $7,000. I, I couldn't rent it out at the time, but I ended up selling it and I still, you know, it came out good. And I was like, geez, this takes me like six, seven months to make this at the post office. Mm -hmm. That's so cool, man. And, and not everybody starts with the auction because they can be You've got to have the cash, and um, oftentimes you don't get to see inside. Were you able to see inside this deal, or were you totally blind? No. It was a 30-minute uh, showing before the auction started. So I went in there 30 minutes before. You don't get no inspection period, no appraisal yeah. period. And basically, I had set up um, – I prepared for this now. So I had basically got a family member to let me get a line of credit on one of their properties. So once I got a line of credit, now I can go in you know, with cash – and I can 
I, my, my goal was to buy the property cash and then go to the bank and refinance and get the money back. But yeah. at the time, I couldn't do it with credit and stuff, so I just sold it. And it was still like a learning curve, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, it, it wasn't the perfect deal, but it was a great deal, and it uh, you obviously learned a lot in the deal. That's 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 so valuable, right? Yeah, and that's I mean, a lot of people you they want to ask questions. They be like, "Do you think this house will pre, um, appreciate? Do you think the market gonna drop?" And it's so many questions when you're going into buying a property that a minute like that property at the auction, you know, it could have been completely bad. But I took a chance, and one of the things you got to do is follow your gut because, you know, I, honestly, I stopped bidding at like forty eight thousand, and my mom was like, you know, you say you want to be a real estate investor. To me, the house looked good, and she was like, bid, bid, and I'm like, you know, and then, <laughs> and I honestly on the last on the last time they were like, I bid, I think fifty two thousand, and they were like, going once, going twice, sold, and I'm like, no, 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 you know, in my head, I want to like. Let the other person get it because I yeah. wasn't sure. I wasn't sure it was a good deal, but you know, at the end of the day, it ended up being a good deal. Yeah, man, that's so cool. And so, how did you come up for those that may obviously that are listening want to get into real estate? How did you? How did you come up with the funds to purchase this? You purchased cash fifty two thousand. Is this stuff that you just saved? Did you get some money from friends and family? How did you come up to? How did you fund this deal? Well, this first property, like I said, I had the line of credit set up. So okay. basically, yeah, I had a family member. They had a property that's paid free and clear. And I tell so many people, you know, that family member have to trust you because, you know, you mess around, lose their house. But I, I had got a line of credit, you know, like a couple months before. So I knew I could um, buy the house. It was just finding a good deal. So basically, I used a line of credit to purchase that first deal. But and, um, after that, you know, I started house hacking and House hacking allowed me to save up all of my housing expense because I had, you know, one side of my house paying for the entire mortgage. So that was like the real way I was able to save that money to keep purchasing rental properties after that. Yeah. Yeah. So so to somebody that's just new to, to real estate, explain to them what house hacking is and give them kind of an example of what, what your first house hack was like. All right. So... All right, like many people watching, your aunts and uncles and grandma and granddad, they normally got a house, you know, three bedroom, two bath, and they typically live there majority of their life. And I was I was going down that mode. I had bought a house, three bedroom, two bath, and I was literally going to work, coming home, paying the bills every day. And I discovered that house hack term on bigger pockets where you, you know, you buy a multifamily, you live on one side and rent out the other side. So I immediately retracted my whole life. I was like, I'm selling my house. I sold my house and I ended up, I stayed with my parents for, me and my wife, we stayed with my parents for maybe like, uh, maybe like seven, six months. But we ended up purchasing a home where it was a, a mother-in-law suite attached to that home. Mm-hmm. So... I found this house. The house hack is when you find you can live in one part of the house and rent another either unit out or, or a guest house. You know, and, and at the time I couldn't find a duplex. So I made this mother in law suite work. So I, I purchased the house and I put the mother in law suite on Airbnb. And immediately my Airbnb was covering my mortgage plus a little bit. And it was like, the green lights went on. Like all my aunts and uncles who thought you're living with a stranger, and I thought I was crazy, you know, because you you do have to share your property if you got a stranger living next to you, which most families don't want to do that. So the older people look at that as you being weird. Yeah. And when I did that, that next month, that next month, you know, where I got to keep my mortgage that I I was normally spending that thousand dollars a month. Now I don't have a mortgage, so I'm saving it. And over time, that that's as up, you know? Yeah. Well, that's super. It's house hacking is so powerful because you are eliminating one of your most, your biggest expenses, your, your living costs, right? Your rent or your mortgage. So if you can have somebody else pay that all of a sudden that frees up, you know, oftentimes living expenses can be 30 or 40% of somebody's income. So all of a sudden you just got a 30 or 40% raise essentially. That's now money that you can 
save and put into other deals or, or whatnot. So if you can eliminate or have somebody else pay for that living expense, it frees up a ton of cash and uh, allows you to save, put away, put away way more money. So that is awesome. And you're doing a cool, you're doing a unique mix of both house hacking and Airbnb, right? Most of the time, house hacking, you're renting it out in a traditional 12-month lease, but you're actually doing the short-term Airbnb style of that second unit which is cool. I haven't, I hadn't heard of that before, but I'm sure, I'm sure the money makes a lot of sense with that kind of a setup. That's way cool, man. Yeah. The, the Airbnb, the, it's more money, you know, Airbnb is more like a hotel. So it was, it's definitely more money, but since the COVID, we kind of turned it into a, um, it's still Airbnb, but I do at least 30 days or more. Oh. So it's not just, I'm going in here. We have somebody clean up every few days. Yeah. But Airbnb is definitely, um, I like Airbnb for the smaller units because I have another house. We had like a big 1,400 square foot house and we would Airbnb it out. But, you know, the guests, their check is two, three people and all the beds are a mess. The whole house was a wreck. Like they had a big party. So I like sticking to like the um, studio suites or one bedroom apartments for my mm-hmm. Airbnbs. Who who do you find that you're cl- – who, who are you finding – that's your client for that kind of a scenario. Who, who's renting this place from you? For 30 days? Yeah. Uh, most of the time you get a lot of nurses. And like right now I got a couple there from up north and they're building a boat. So I, I, honestly, I think you get less, you get more settled people when you rent out long term. You know, mm-hmm. people are here for working or family functions, but it's more uh, steady and less likely you'll get a party or something crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a smart tactic, man. I had not thought of that before. So that that's super cool. So, so now you've got a few properties um, and in the timeline here, right? So you've got a few properties. When did you kind of start saying, or when did you start getting comfortable with the idea of, Hey, I can, I can leave my, my mailman job and I can make real estate my full-time thing. When did that kind of become an option for you? Right. So, all right, that's kind of, I'm trying to do a short story, but it was, I was working at the post office, you know, every day you have breaks at work. Every day at break at work, I'm talking to my other mail carriers, how bad we hate this job, how we want to do this and do that. You know, every job got that. Oh yeah. 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 You know, so, so we talking about that and, but I really hated my job. Like seriously, I was like, this is not for me. I'm stuck in this tin can all day. I just, I feel dead. So it was a Monday morning at the post office and um, I had did my route. I had my route, but the um, supervisor came and said, somebody called out. So George, can you take this extra half a route? And mind you, I'm on the eight hour day. That means you work eight hours a day. So I'm like, no, I don't really want to take that. I like getting off at five o'clock every day. So I did the route that day and it was a lot of mail and I did the extra route too. So when I got home, I had a headache and I'm telling my wife, I'm not feeling good and this and that. And I ended up using the bathroom and when I used the bathroom. I had blood in my stool. I'm like, you know, it scared me. So I'm like, I told my wife what was going on. She said, let's call the hospital or not go to call the hospital. We went to the emergency room. I went to the emergency room. And they checked me out and whatever, and they were like, um, him was bleeding. Mm-hmm. But I said, but they said, hold on, this is the catch. They were like, but we still got to make sure you don't have cancer, you know, because you bleed out your stool. So I'm like, huh? You know, I'm young. I'm, I was like 28, 29 at the time. So yeah. I'm like, no way, no way. And I just had my son. I got a one-year-old. So I'm like, uh-huh. this scared me. So... I'm like, I called a job in the emergency room and, you know, I can't, I won't be to work tomorrow. And they were like, you're not coming to work tomorrow? Uh, like, they didn't care what was wrong with me. They were like, no, you need to come to work tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, geez, they really don't care. So the next day I go and get checked out, whatever. And they were like, you know, I prayed. I was like, God, you know, if I don't have cancer, when I go in, go in this doctor office and come back, I promise you, I will do my purpose. I knew my purpose was real estate investor. You know, but I couldn't just do it because I didn't really have the funds and I I had a family. So I prayed. I said, God, if I don't have cancer, when I come out, I'm going to live the life 
you want me to live. I'm going to do, I'm going to help the world. I'm, I'm good at real estate. So I help families find properties. I do everything. So I made that promise. So when the doctor said, oh no, you know, everything's good. I was like, geez, I got to live up to what I just said, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. That's so kind of an awakening story, right? Anytime you have those kinds of scares, right? It makes you think a little more clearly about how you're allocating time. So you find out everything's good, no cancer. Um, what do you, do you, wh- how much, how far, how long after that before you finally quit the, the mailman job and how did that go down? Well, I never went back after that. You I, never I, went back. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I went on with, um, we, it was right around Memorial Weekend. So me and my wife, and we went to a, a beach on the West Coast of Florida and I seen a male lady and I was like, um, I used to do that, and I think I'm. I don't think I'm going back. And she was like, "Yeah, I think about quitting every day." I'm like, "You think about quitting every day?" So I was like, blown out because I think a lot, like maybe seventy five percent of the people may hate their job sometimes. And I'm like, "So we all hate our job, but we can't quit because we ain't got this lifestyle we got to maintain." So mm-hmm. you know, I, I came back on vacation. I'm like, "Dang," she said she think about quitting every day. That's not good life. So. I come back home and, you know, I wrote up my two weeks notice and I said, I'll, I'm going to go into the post office. That morning, I was supposed to quit on a Monday. And, you know, it was like four o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm like, oh, I got to go to work. I want to quit, but I need to go to work. Just had a son. And I literally, you know, I turned on the TV and, you know, I'm, I Googled first. I Googled, God, would you tell me to quit my job? Because it didn't make sense. I Googled that. And. Google, you know, it was coming up with just weird stuff, but it didn't take but less than like two minutes. I turned on the TV and it was like one of them infomercials where the pastor preaching. And he was like, the answer to your question is yes, you will be okay. Yes, you will be successful. Yes, you will eat. Yes, you will take care of your family. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm like, dang, that was so bright. So yeah. immediately, you know, I'm like, it's four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, that's it. I'm not going. So that morning I wake up, I had probably like 10, 12 uniforms. I grabbed them out of the closet. I threw all of them in the um, trash bag. I kept one uniform. I'm going to use that for my book cover when I write my book. I'm going to get a uniform on. But I took all my uniforms and I threw it in the trash can. I took it outside and I threw it in the dumpster. So I really didn't have a way. I didn't have clothes to wear to work. So that was it. You know, I took my two weeks notice and I told everybody I'm retiring. They were like, you can't retire. You've only been here five years. I said, well, I ain't working no more. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, George, that is so inspiring. I got goosebumps. That is such a cool story. Uh, yeah. Definitely not easy to do. I mean, obviously you had to kind of get comfortable with the idea, but um, but man, hopefully hopefully the listeners are are feeling that inspiration too and and the, uh, the confidence to do. If, if they're in the same situation where they just don't like their job, and uh, that they are hopefully feeling encouraged and inspired to do the same, man. Well, yeah, and the, the key to that whole story was I didn't, like, uh, when I say the story, it probably sounds like I just did that, like, a two-week span. No, for that 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 first year, you know, I, I didn't really study real estate. But the, last, the four years before that, all I did for, like, eight to ten hours a day was listen to Gary Vendetta, Grant Cardone, Bigger Pockets. You know, so my head was, like, I was, like, ready to jump out. You know what I mean? It was just, imagine doing that every day. So I had, I've been house hacking for a whole year. So I'm saving up money. So I had a nest egg. Like I knew I could survive for at least a year. You know, my wife was still working. So it wasn't just like I quit and I'm going to just starve. So I just basically um, started getting my feet. I put two feet in real estate and I had a nest egg. So it was more like I wasn't panicking. And I just finally got my groove. After four months, I purchased two houses back to back. Then a few months after that, I purchased two more properties, and it's it just kept on rolling. Dude, that that's awesome. What would you say to somebody that's listening to this, and they're just they're like, I can't. No, nah, there's no way I can ever do that. You know, I'm stuck in my job. There's that's not that's not possible for me. What would you say to somebody that's having those thoughts? Well. Well, first of all, you can't say I can't. You you got to change that to how can I? How can I? How can I? Right. So, I I would say you know you you gotta. 
I always, this was me and my wife did. We used to write our obituary down. So, you know, even though we don't plan on dying no time soon, I wrote it down. This is what my obituary I wanted to look like. It didn't have the word post office in it. It had traveling, family, uh, giving back, helping the community. So when I think of all them things, what do I have to do to live that life? You know? And if if you want to, you know, you want to quit your job and and chase a purpose, you you can't just quit your job. You got to set yourself up for success, you know? And I, I can't tell you what you got to do, but if it's in real estate, you got to figure out whether you want to be a, you know, a realtor or, or I was a cash flow person. So my whole objective was buying cash flow properties that just cash flow great because I knew I wasn't getting a paycheck next week. So mm-hmm. I had to replace that paycheck, you know, to make me feel at least a little settled. You know, that, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Um, so, so now, I mean, so you, you, you're, everything's going good. You're buying properties. You picked up more, more houses. What's, where do you see yourself going from here? What's kind of the next steps for George? The next step is right. Well, right. I started out buying a lot of rental property, not a lot, but to me it's a lot. So I built up enough cash flow where I can, <laughs> Now, I don't think I'm financial free, but I can make pay my bills with my rent. So now I've been focusing on um, flipping a few properties. So my whole goal is now is like maybe um, keep a couple, flip a couple, flip, rent a couple, flip a couple. And I can't really tell you that I'm a flipper, I'm a renter, I'm a wholesaler. I do whatever the house call for. I'm mm-hmm. a realtor also. So I may just sell the house. I may buy the house. I may wholesale the house. I may, um, you know, rent it, flip it. I come at the deal. I come at the deal and figure out what's best for that deal. I don't come into the deal like I'm this person and I just do this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Keeping your options open. So how long have you? So you uh, you quit your mailman job in 2019. Um, how? But how long has it been since you bought that that first property at the auction? How many years? That. No, I bought that first property. That was when I bought that first property. That was probably like three years ago. That was when I was still at the post office. Yeah, so yeah. I, I bought that property, and then I actually didn't. I made like that twenty some thousand dollars on that, and I didn't buy another property no more until I ended up quitting. Yeah, and you would have thought I would have did it again, right? But <laughs> good deals, like I say, good deals don't come all the times, but when they come. You got to act fast and an auction is fast paced. You're taking risks, but it's fast paced. So after, after I quit the post office in May of 2019, I purchased my first, my first property was mandatory. It was a duplex. I purchased that duplex because I knew I needed, I needed income bad because I lost, I was making like $50,000 a year. So I'm like, I need income. I need, so I purchased a duplex first. And then after that, I ended up the next month, I purchased a Airbnb property and then I got them set up because even when I got the properties, I was kind of anxious to just get them rented. I was excited to be a landlord. So I would say even now, I made a few mistakes by renting to people <laughs> based off of if I like them instead of doing, you know, what you're supposed to go by the books and get background and credit checks. Yeah. Yeah. So... And now that you're kind of rolling here, what, how are you funding these deals? Are you still doing it all personally, or do you have some private investors using hard money, or is it all to your own funds or your own lines of credit? No, um, for the most part, is me and my wife. You know, we do ours. Then I do have one partner that we purchase property together. So basically, I, you know, I do. I find the properties, and I have a partner. He'll come in and help with the financing, and we just fifty-fifty everything. Okay. Awesome, yes. man. We are killing it, man. That's, that's so cool. So, so what's uh, for somebody that's trying to get started into real estate? What would be what would be your piece of advice as they kind of your most important advice you could give them as they get started? Uh, my biggest advice would be, I would say, because I, I I was always comparing my life to the people on these podcasts. These mm-hmm. podcast people that you're here most of the time got 20, 30 years in the in the game. And it's like, I'm comparing, I, I think Brandon Turner at the time, he probably had like 75, Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets, probably had like 60, 70, units. he used to always say, 
I'm like, man, I'm comparing my life to his. But I would say for anybody who's trying to be a real estate investor, don't compare your story or how many units you have to me because it's a journey. And every deal, you you got to learn. Because I listen to all these podcasts and I still learn. Like, I learned a lot today, you know, because it's things that you're going to go through that you didn't read in a book and you haven't heard nobody experience it. So you have to learn what you can from books, but take action. Go out there and buy a deal. Whether it's good or bad, you know, just getting a deal done makes you, it's like snowball effect, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah, that's important. It's so so easy to get discouraged when you're comparing yourself to somebody that's been doing it for 15 or 20 years. Like you're just not going to be at that level and you should not feel bad if you're not. Um, sometimes, uh, yeah, it's just super simple. It's super easy to kind of get feeling down when you're not there, but uh, it's not a fair comparison. It's just not. You, you, you're, no. Your competition is yourself and that's all you should be comparing yourself to. Does that and, mean? And, and also, like you say that, also asking people advice who don't even own a properties like i used to always ask people you think it's they don't own a house they don't even buy properties and they tell me every book and the reason why i shouldn't buy so that would hold me back because i didn't know what a good i didn't honestly trust myself on a good deal so i would ask people all the time and they would be like nah you gotta fix it up you gotta do this people are not gonna pay your rent and it holds you back when the the guy one time a guy told me he say anything that looked crazy usually make a lot of money you know so a lot of times, if you look at something and it looks weird and strange and crazy, oftentimes it can make a lot of money. You mm-hmm. know, people call me crazy when I quit my job. <laughs> that that was a good sign that you were doing the right thing, right? What? Yeah, it didn't feel like it, but at the same time, I knew deep down inside, you know, what my calling is and what my purpose is. God ain't tell them that that's my purpose, so they looking at me like, "What you doing, man? You you over there?" You're not paying attention in the meetings and this and that. Cause I would literally be at work and my mind is just so far gone from work. Yeah. And I see yeah. people in that situation all the time. And I I like I'll be at Subway and somebody making my sandwich, but they making it, but their mind is somewhere else. And I'd be like, dude, what you do? He's like, I work at Subway. No, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I like to play computers. Yeah. Well, why are you here making subs? Go get on the computer, you know? Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> So, so you mentioned a little bit in in our in the the bio that you wrote um, you, that you kind of you identified your gift or your purpose in life, and that once you started going after that, that's really what uh, brought more fulfillment and joy into your life. Kind of tell us a little bit more about that. What you what you identify as your purpose and gift, and and, and how that motivates you. Right. Okay. That's a good question. That's a great question, actually. Because when I was a mailman, you know, I, I used to be traveling and we would be going on vacation. And you know how you meet a stranger and you say, oh, what do you do? And I always said, I'm a, I'm a mailman. I work for the post office. And they'd be like, whoa, that's a great job. You got good benefits. And, you know, I walk away and I have my head down. And I'm like, I should have said I'm a real estate investor. I'm not no freaking <laughs> mailman. You know what I mean? So... You know, I knew that deep down inside. That was years ago. So, um, you know, that when that situation happened, when I told you about the story, that was one of the things that made me, you know, step into it to be like, hey, listen, this is me, Blunt. I'm a real estate investor. And you know your purpose because, you know, in college, I in college, right, I went to college and I got my degree in accounting. But all throughout college, I made C's. It's a couple of D's, it's a couple of B's, but I made C's. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I basically got B's on the test. No, no, I got D's on the test, and um, I did all the homework, all that's credit. So the average would come out of a C, B. Mm-hmm. But my last semester, you know, my family was coming to um, Tallahassee, Florida. I was in school in Tallahassee, and I was failing a class, right? I had like a D in it. And, you know, if you're in college, anybody know that last semester, you still, you know, have to pass in order to graduate. Mm-hmm. Well, that that class, that I got a D, so I couldn't graduate. And I'm like, geez, man, I got my family coming from everywhere to see me graduate. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm not really graduating, but I got to walk this stage, you know? So 
it's, it's a celebration for everybody. But at the same time, me deep down inside, I knew I really didn't graduate. So I, I go to the graduation. The teacher that gave me the D, you know, he's standing there. He's got to shake his hand, you know, play it off and whatever. So I'm like, geez, man. So the next semester, you know, after graduation leave, I say, well, I'm going to just go ahead and take this one class and pass it. Mind you, I take this class again. I failed again. I got another D. So I'm like, geez, man, I got one class just to get my uh, bachelor degree. And this teacher keep giving me a D. So I'm like, maybe I should just, everybody think I graduated. So maybe I should just leave it at that, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't give up though. I ended up transferring from my last semester to a different school just to take that one class. And I ended up passing, you know, I passed it with like a B easy, mm -hmm. but you know, what that taught me was, you know, God, he made things hard for me. So I would, I don't give up. I appreciate my degree. I never even used it to this day still, but that lesson taught me, like, I didn't give up, you know, and I had to go through that by myself. Everybody thinking I'm graduating. I'm like, man, I'm not graduating. I still don't have my degree. And that just taught me, like, you you can't give up. You got to keep chasing your dreams. And it made me stronger. So now, like, you know, walking on across the stage, knowing you didn't graduate is like sickness. So now, like, when I turn a deal in or offering, they didn't neglect it. It's like, that's nothing compared to what I've already been through, you know? Mm -hmm. That's such a cool story, man. And uh, I love that point of view where, you, you know, you you appreciated or embraced the resistance or the difficulty of earning that degree. Um, I think as natural human beings, we want to avoid difficult and uncomfortable things. And thank goodness God knew that he would have to create situations where we would be uncomfortable and have resistance. Otherwise, we would never become what he desired, wants us to become. And uh, I think that's, that's, a profound, uh, that's a profound statement, a profound point that you made there. That's awesome. But, yeah. but what I was getting to was with that story, you know, I made D's and C's in college. But when I took my realtor test, um, I got 90%. When I took my um, real estate test to get my license... I passed with flying colors. So I'm like, real estate test, you know, I'm not a good test taker, but for real estate, I pass all the tests. Real estate come easy to me. So yeah. everybody in life, something you do better than everybody around you. Like they call you because you made the best pies or they call you because you're good with mechanic work. Yeah. So find out what people, what are your five friends, what they always call you for when they're in trouble. That's yeah. probably close to your purpose or your gift, you yeah. know? So that's when I discovered, like, I passed all the tests for real estate. Mm, that's kind of weird. I'm not a good test taker. I come to my broker. I just started. I'm selling the most houses now. Hmm. It's my yeah. purpose. Now I don't feel like work because I don't have to try the real estate. Like, I didn't have to prepare for this because real estate, you know, but if we start talking about something else, it's going to be like, I'll be quiet because, you know what I mean? Yeah. So do you yeah. think that you're, you, do you think that um, you were able to succeed and do better on those, on the real estate test, because it's something that you're more passionate about and, and, and there's a natural, like you say, it's a natural gift. I mean, obviously when you're passionate about something, you're, it's just easier to learn, easier to remember things, easier to, you know, study and just be excited about it. So what yeah, does that passion have? Yeah, I think that is the key, too, I think, because I'm like, my mom was like, you didn't start reading books until you graduated high school, but I read books about real estate, financial freedom. In college, in high school, you read books about, you know, Asia or sharks or stuff, and it didn't catch my interest, so I wouldn't remember it. But if I read something about real estate or really listen to audio books, because I discovered I, don't, I can't learn about reading. I have to listen. So it's like, think about how many people going through life not even knowing that they can't read and comprehend because they learn by visual or audio. I learn by listening. If I listen to something, I can tell you what you said. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just that passion. I think it helped. It helped. It become easier for me to do it. Like today I probably did real estate all day, but would I trade it to go do a mail route? No, 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 no. You know? <laughs> yeah, I love that, man. So what do you think separates those that, uh, succeed in real estate or in accomplishing their goals from those that struggle and, and don't make it? What's the, what's something that separates those people? 
Well, all right. I think one thing I think for a lot, I read a lot of biographies on successful people. And I wonder why some people don't have that fire in their stomach. And I think maybe they haven't went through something in life. Like, imagine somebody told you, um, you got 24 hours to live. How would you live? Dude. Right? Mm-hmm. Differently. Mm-hmm. Or even one year. You got one year to live. I Watch how many people start living. You know, and yeah. I live, it's a sad thing about it. You know, people don't want to say it, but every day, you know, you it's like, I listen to a lot of Miles Monroe. He's a motivational speaker, but he passed away. But he always say, you know, the, the most are the dreams and goals are in the graveyard because most people live to 95 years old, 80 years old, and they never pursue their purpose or passion. They just went through life cruising, you know, so they fit in. And it's like, if I would have stayed there, First of all, I wouldn't help all these homeowners. I help become homeowners. So that's being selfish, you know, not to use your gift to make the world a better place. You just gonna keep it to yourself. Mm-hmm. So, wait, what was your question? So what? What's the <laughs> thing that separates those that succeed from those that don't in in real estate or in whatever they're doing? What's the thing that separates them? Oh yeah. So the main thing that that, that separates them is, um, I think you need to get angry. Man, if when you become like, say you go to um, Walmart and the lines aren't moving, me, I'll be like, why aren't these lines moving? You got self checkout, you know, anything that makes you tick. Like some people are passionate about, like whatever you're passionate about, you passionate about grass, you just get mad about it, and that usually, if it makes you kind of get a certain way, that usually means you have a passion for that. But discovering your, you know, discovering your purpose and whatnot. That's that's more that's more like internal. You have to figure out what you think about every day. Like every day when I was in that mail truck, I still thought about real estate every single day. So I'm pretty sure every day people who go to that job, what's that one thing you think about every day? No matter if you're what your job is, you still think about this every day. And I think that's somewhere you need to be around because when you're around that, life becomes not so tough. You know, you live, you live it's smoother. It's like a, instead of a bumpy car ride because you're trying to fit in, it's more like, oh, I'm supposed to be here. So you're saying you're saying that if you can align the, what you're doing, where you're spending your time in life with your passion and purpose and what you're, you know, like you say, what you're thinking about the most, that's going to help you succeed, right? Yeah, that that's definitely a starting point, you know? And one thing I, I started doing now, I write everything down. I write Every day, like on Sunday, every day I write what I'm, what's my goals for that day or that week. And because when I first quit, I tell you, I was scared. I started applying for jobs like, I don't know if I've made the right decision. <laughs> so, you know, it took time for me to actually start, you know, getting the confidence to know like, oh, no, the stuff that I'm reading these books, they actually work. Like, write your goals down. Write them mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. It works. And then when you, when you, when you, not don't when you accomplish your goal, don't scratch it out. Put a check mark, success, you know, because you accomplish that. Because a lot of times you go through the whole day, like today I had maybe an inspection. And the inspection, it didn't go too good. You know, they, you know, I'm selling the property. They marking up all these things. Yeah. But guess what? Yeah, that didn't go good. But the seven other things that I did, I accomplished. So now I don't feel like it was just a bad day. Yeah. Yeah, you got to identify a, a win every day, even if it's a small win. Uh, you've got to identify. Otherwise, we just dwell on the the things that didn't go well, and it can be it can get depressing. Uh, it can be frustrating. So yeah, I I make a habit of just trying to identify something good that happened, even if it was a really bad day, some kind of W that I can take home and be excited about. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned the check boxes, like checking it off. Like I I literally like if you look at my daily plan, my daily goals, I've got little boxes that I draw all over my notepad because I want to be able to check them off because I want to feel like I know it's totally, you know, in your mind, but I want to be able to check them off so that I know that I am accomplishing things, getting things moved along and making progress. So that I, that's huge, man. Good, good tips. Yeah. And I think the, the main thing is people don't think it worked into it. Cause like my dad, I would say, Oh, that don't work in real life. You know, you can't just buy all these houses and get all this debt. It doesn't work. That's fake. That's people on TV. No, nah, man, listen, you read these books, you listen to these podcasts, 
it's really works. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I use everything I learned from these podcasts on these deals. And it's like, you got to trust it. You got to trust the process because you can't see the finish line, but I know it's that way. Yeah. You know, that's where I'll, I'll plug the bigger pockets podcast right here. Cause I, there's, it's such an awesome podcast, not just for like the, you know, the, the strategy and tactics of how to invest in real estate, but my favorite thing about that podcast, and there's many others, including this one, obviously, that where you hear stories of other people succeeding and all this stuff actually working. And that is the mo- one of the most encouraging things for me as I, as, I was, as I started my own real estate journey. I would hear people like you, hey, he did it. He, he was, got enough real estate under his belt that he could quit his job as a mailman or whatever the story is, like those were some of the most motivating stories. And yeah, I was learning tidbits here and there of how to, you know, how to buy properties, how to make offers and things like that. But the most valuable thing was just hearing those stories of success. Uh, That's what uh, honestly kept the most, kept me, kept the faith, kept the hope that I could get there one day. So um, them become, them became my friends, man. When I was in that bell truck, because I was working 10 hours a day because people don't count that drive time to work. So it took me 30 minutes to get to work. Take me 30 minutes to get ready. Yeah. So that's an hour you get ready for work. I, they come home and take 30 minutes. So the whole time I'm in the car too, I get home. I count that as I'm at work because I'm not doing what I want to do. So if, if you, I mean, you working that much, it's wait, what did you just say? <laughs> I was talking about, uh, uh, the like hearing the stories of success on on yeah podcasts and yeah stuff. yeah for them ten I was in the, I was in the mail truck man them was my friends the people I said on the podcast because my friends in real life you know everybody got a normal job they go home they just do regular stuff in my real life so like Gary V was my best friend like I started thinking like him like you know this is this is going hard mm-hmm. and I'm comparing my success to their success their success is way up there. You know, so you got to, you got to get around like-minded people, whether it's in real life or fake life, you got to get around like-minded people. Yeah, I love it. I think it's super important listening to whoever it is, Grant Cardone, Gary V, uh, the Brandon Turner, Bigger Pockets team, like whoever it's, you've got to have daily, I believe you have to have daily doses of that um, because your mind naturally drifts to a negative place, to a wants to stay in a comfortable place. And so you've got to continually daily dose that mindset. That's a little step above a little step out there to encourage you to think bigger and have confidence that you can accomplish your goals and be creative about how you're going to get there. Uh, You've got to listen to people that think that way to get your mind right. And I I think that's an important thing. It's got to happen daily because it only takes a little while and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're, Oh man, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be able to pull this off. I don't think I'm going to be able to buy real estate. I'll never quit my job. Uh, it's easy to get back to that. If you're not con- constantly feeding and nurturing the right mindset. Right. Definitely. You got, you, you got to every, every single day. And you know, the crazy thing, Justin, I can't listen to a podcast now consistent. Like when I was in that mail truck, you know, I'm stuck in a seat. I can go through a whole hour and a half. Like Tim Ferriss podcast, like three hours. So mm-hmm. I literally can listen to it. But now I you got you probably give me 20 minute segments because I'm actually doing it, you know? Yeah. But I think that be, being stuck in like a where I, I couldn't leave. So I, I would listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, you take advantage of it when you can. Like with COVID, yeah. I work from home so much now that I I don't have the drive time to work to to commute to work anymore, so it's harder to get those real those podcast episodes in. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's a ton of uh, free information out there, free motivation out there through so those different podcasts. I mean, there's a ton um, that are out there that are super valuable. Um, a couple of final questions here, and then we will wrap up. But uh, what is your favorite book, business book, real estate book that's really had a powerful impact on your life? Mm. Oh man, so many. Favorite book, real estate book. All right, real estate book. Oh man. I got a book. It's called How to Get Rich in Real Estate. And it's a real old book. 
black and yellow cover. Mm-hmm. And that book, because I'm like I said, I was a C student, so I need you to break this down for a dummy language. And that's what that book do. How to get rich in real estate is is written probably like back in 1950s, mm-hmm. but it explained the the, the power of multifamily. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's back then houses were like maybe say in the book five thousand dollars. You know, fifteen percent return on that money is a good deal. So mm-hmm. now I know, you know, I can measure it's smaller numbers back then, but I can just measure it to today's number. So for me, like even people got different books, you have to find how you learn. I, I don't want nothing too complicated, you know. I just want the basics. Yeah. Rich dad, poor dad, you know, that's simple. Mm-hmm. Very good. Good, good recommendation. So tell us a little bit more about, we've talked a little bit about it, but what's your why? What's your purpose now that you kind of created some freedom for yourself? You don't have the nine to five. Um, what's your why? What keeps you motivated now? Mm, what keeps me motivated now? What's my why? Oh, man. Man, my why, honestly, you know, it's it's hard to explain like how much happier I am that I know my purpose and I live it because like Monday morning I went to my one of my friends' house and his grandma was like, um, you working already? And I'm like, yeah, it's Monday, you know. But I honestly don't really consider it work because I enjoy, it. you know, I would I ain't gonna say I do for free, but it's not work. It's like I'm working towards a goal, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not like I'm just Working like at jobs, and some people they working towards the clock. Oh, it's twelve thirty. Let me take a smoke break. Oh, yeah, you know, and that's how I was. I was on that clock. I was working by the clock. Now I'm working with emotion. You know, everything is different. So that's. I mean, my why is you know ultimately create financial freedom. And it's hard for me. Like right now, my wife still work, and it's hard for a person. Like think about Beyonce, right? Imagine if she married a regular person or Michael Jackson, because they they know their purpose. So when somebody know their purpose, they can do it a hundred hours a week and not feel tired of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and me, I have to stop myself from working because I enjoy it. I enjoy doing podcasts. I enjoy doing real estate. I enjoy doing my YouTube videos about real estate. So I have to remind myself. Hold on, I I got it. My wife, she's not in that in that in that the same mind state yet. So I got to I got to go be normal. You know, I can't just go balls to the wall. In real estate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I like that. I love it. I think what you said there, you know, don't work just to work, but work towards a goal. And when you, I think that's why a lot of times people are just are not happy in their job because they're just working. Like you said, working to the clock, they don't have an end game. I mean, you have an end game of, I'm sure a certain income level, a certain amount of doors, certain goals that you have and and ways to give back and to help other people throughout the, throughout your journey. And uh, that ultimately makes it sound, makes it feel because you're still working, obviously let's, let's be clear with the listeners. Like you're still putting in work, but it's a different kind of work with a different level of passion and more closely aligned with your purpose, which is awesome. So um, one question I always like to ask also is what are you doing to give back? What are you doing to, to help others in, in, in various aspects of their lives? Well, like now, one of the, the main thing is because, you know, people call me, George, you got into work. People actually depend on me to provide a paycheck for them. Mm. So I'm like, I, sometimes I feel like I might not make nothing off that job, but my workers, they'll still be making money. So mm-hmm. now I look at it like, you know, you know, God put me in position because people who are in control of a lot of stuff, it's a reason you're in control because if you are responsible, you get more and more stuff. So, you know, when I say I give you a dollar, you lose it. I'm not giving another dollar. But if I give you a dollar and then you keep it and make it three dollars, oh, give you another dollar. And that's how I feel like God is doing. Like, as long as I keep doing responsible stuff, he's going to let me provide for other people. Sometimes I can't make no money. I don't know what to do. You know what I do? I give some money away and it come back. Boom. Mm, mm-hmm. I don't know why it does that, but it's like, if I can't see no cash flow coming in, I give some money away, help somebody, help a family member or mm-hmm. do something. But my main thing is, yeah, just 
helping one thing I want to help a lot of older people. I realized they had a purpose, but they wasn't able to live that purpose because they were they had to take care of their house. You got to got to take care of home first. So you got to have a job. So my whole thing now is helping other people. Don't everybody not gonna be a real estate investor, but if you find your purpose, you will make the world a better place because normally you know you got a gift. Everybody got a gift, and that's what I'm all about making the world. Like right now, it's so tense with all the stuff going on. And it's like people are out of bounds. They're they're rushing. Like on Monday mornings, I don't even get up and go nowhere until like around 11, 12 o'clock because I remember always seeing car accidents on Monday mornings because people are rushing to work. Mm-hmm. I'm late. I was late Monday mornings, shoot. So I'm rushing. So now Monday mornings, you know what I do? I let everybody go to work and then I start moving. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, man. I love that. Well, this has been awesome, man. I appreciate the conversation. Uh, any, if people want to follow you or reach out to you, where, where can they find you, man? Yes. If you want to find me the best place, um, Instagram it is George do real estate. Also on uh, YouTube, George do real estate. I basically show the rehabs, the flip, the rentals. I just documented my journey really. And then I also have my podcast, the New American Dream Podcast. New American Dream Podcast. Okay, perfect. We'll have that stuff in the notes, man. Anything else you'd like to share before we before we wrap it up, man? I appreciate the everything you've done so far. I mean, my, my recommendation to the people listening to this, you know, if you're still watching from the beginning now, is follow your gut. And when you follow your gut, you really can't think. Like nowadays, I don't use my mind. I use this. Because at the end of the day, if I feel right about it, usually it's the right decision. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, guys, reach out to George if you have questions for him. Feel If you're feeling inspired by his story, by his story tell him thanks. Uh, George, thank you for being on the show. Uh, this has been great, man. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Justin. Thanks for listening to the Money Maven Project Podcast. A true maven shares knowledge with others. So be sure to share this podcast and leave a review. Thanks so much. And until next time, live life with intention.